Amen. In the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 23 through 24, it reads, And he said to them all, I read, excuse me a second, I apologize. First, give another slide to the angel of this house, Pastor Phillips, co Pastor Phillips in the back, to my pastor, my late lady in her absence, Pastor Johnny and Elder Milton, amen. amen, to my youth pastor, Pastor Collins, amen, to Elder Williams for this invite. I do not take it lightly to be up here standing before you, amen. amen. I'm not a hooper. I'll be honest with you, I can't hoop, I stay in my lane. But I can teach you happy. If it works with me, we'll make it work. Amen. I won't be before you long at all. Amen. So in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 23 through 24, it reads, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my name's sake, the same shall save it. And for topical purposes, we're going to read chapter Romans 14, 7 through 9. It says, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live, or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Yeah. For this thing, Christ died. Yeah. Amen. Grab that neighbor by the hand and tell him, neighbor. neighbor. So good to see you tonight. So good to see you need all your prayers. Need all your prayers. All your amens. All your amens. Tonight's lesson is, Tonight's lesson is committed, to sell out. committed to sell out. And before you leave him, before you leave him, keep in line with the lesson and the theme on this week. Tell him, since I'm committed to sell out, it's all or nothing. Oh, Knock those hands and tell God thank you. Bear with me a moment as I set the stage, amen. The influential John Calvin took a pilgrimage, smack dab in the middle of his life to go to a place called Calcutta. He was in search of where he was going to spend the second phase of his life and wanted direction for where God was going to lead him. While he would be there, he would do his missionary work in the place called the House of the Dying. His second day there, he would encounter Mother Teresa. He would approach Mother Teresa and ask her, Mother Teresa, would you pray for me? Mother Teresa replied, sure. What is your request? His response was, well, pray that God gives me clarity. She looks down at him with a despondent face and said, clarity is the last thing that we're clinging to and the first thing you need to get rid of. Then somewhat confused, he looked at her and said, well, I always deemed you to be a person that often knew how to journey through life with a sense of direction. She said, son, Clarity is something I've never asked for and never obtained. Rather, I've always had trust. And that's what I would pray for, is that you learn to trust. Moving forward, <coughs> Pastor Phillips, we're living in a day and time where they call the trend that we're approaching or the time that we're approaching this dispensation uh, the day of the millennials. It's the PC and the Mac era. Uh -huh. A day where knowledge and man's wisdom has soared to a level unimaginable right. than before. Yeah. The problem with this era is it has allowed man, well rather, God has allowed man to seep into his wisdom and the things in the awesome splendor of God. Yes. And in hopes that we would look at the wonderful works of God and render praise in return. All right. The problem with this generation is that we saw the miraculous splendor of God and instead of rendering praise to him, we took it for ourselves. So now when we should give God glory for the wonderful things he has done, we think man has manipulated and done things and so God needs no recognition. 
And because of this mindset, we scuffle back and forth. Amen. We're toggling within our minds that surely because we think that it's okay to oblige in our own self-indignation, so our own self-will and self-pleasure, that God doesn't need any glory, or rather that he is okay. Because we manipulate our minds into thinking and believing that I think like this, so certainly God thinks like this. But we forget one thing the Bible says that our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. We can't think for God. The issue that we struggle with as believers is that since we have disregarded God, what we did is we thrust ourselves into a place of carnality. And because we're in a place of carnality, the Bible says that a man that is carnal can't receive of God. Neither can he discern the voice of God or the things that are spiritual of God. They, 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 are, they are somewhat foolish to him. Folly is what the Bible says. It's a bad thing to be a believer and for God to speak and you not know his voice. It's even worse. For you to hear a voice and you not to be able to discern that it's the voice of God. Or is it man? The Bible says that there is an image uh, uh, that sits out in the atmosphere with that looks like a blank or bleaker of light that will present itself. He knows how to look like God. He knows how to sound like God. He knows how to speak like God. I mean, let me just come on down the road. I mean, he can speak in tongues like he's a God. He can sing worship in the church like he's God. He can, he can preach like he's God. But at the end of the day, he's just an image. Satan has this cunning inability to make himself look like God. But I'm so glad that my sheep know my voice. And a stranger one of here too. Paul says in Galatians 3 and 1, oh foolish Galatians who has bewitched you? I can't hoop guys fellas and I break the podium up here I instead of hooping I just kind of <laughs> call them into attention y'all hear, y'all hear me attention in Luke chapter 18 you don't have to go there because I've already read the scripture that I'm going to and I'm going to be done quick, y'all. And in Luke chapter 18, see, this is youth night. I can tell you, I'm, one thing I've never forgot about Pastor Phyllis, I'm, I'm not that old, but one thing I remember is that I didn't like long church as a youth. <laughs> so I ain't going to keep y'all long. Is that all right? Unless the Spirit of God take over, then we all got to come subject. Amen. 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 Luke chapter 18, amen. It records an encounter that Jesus had with the young man. Amen. He had an encounter with a young man that is not identified by name, but simply by a title. He was important enough to be recognized and recorded in three of the four Gospels, but insignificant enough to have a name. The Bible called him the rich young ruler. Rich young ruler would approach Jesus one day and come unto him and say, Good master, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, first of all, calls him from out of the, uh, calls him out from uh, looking at him in a natural sense and begins to tell him, "Why callest thou good? Ain't nobody good but God, and my Father that is in heaven." But you know what to do to inherit eternal life. He says, "Keep the commandments. Yeah. You know what they are. Yeah. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Amen. Honor your mother and your father. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, keep the Sabbath day holy, and etc. etc." I can sense the rich young ruler probably had a sigh of relief, like, shoosh, thank God for that, because the Bible says, well, God, he says, Jesus, all these I have kept yeah, yeah. since the days of my youth. Yes. Jesus replies and says, but one thing you lack, sell all your possessions and give to the poor and come and follow me. Let me pause for a moment to give a note in this message in the text because I want you to understand something that's actually happened here. What Jesus is telling the rich young ruler is to to get rid of everything that makes you you. Understand something. The Bible don't call him by name. He call him by what he is and where his heart is. A rich young ruler. The owner of many things. Jesus is telling him to get rid of your identity. Get rid of everything that makes up you and makes you you. When people look at you, they see your stuff. When people look at you, they see what you possess. Get rid of the very thing that you are. And come and follow me. 
get rid of your identity. Get rid of the things that people have come accustomed to seeing you with. Get rid of the things that make you happy. Get rid of your ideas. Get rid of your philosophy. Get rid of your way. Come and follow me. It's never a good thing for believers to be identified with intangibles, or rather with tangibles, and not with substance. Amen. Can you imagine that Jesus, or God rather, would look down at his son, a man that sits on the right hand of the Father, looks at his son and see the, the, the wounds on his back, see the pistons in his hands, the holes in his feet, the scar of thorns on his forehead. Can you just imagine that when God looks at this, and when he looks down at the very man that he suffers like, sacrificed himself for, that he went to the cross for, that he was beaten for, my son was beaten for, the blood that was shed, and when he look at man, he sees no image of the blood. His son suffered. But when I look at the man that he suffered for, I don't see the blood. I don't see, I don't see any, any traces or evidence that God has worked in their favor or that they have accepted Christ. As sovereignty and sovereign Lord. I don't see. I don't see choices of, uh, of the blood covering. Of choices of blood that's left for them. But rather what I see is, is, is provision for the flesh. I see where people have never denied anything. They constantly move by the beat of their own drum. Well I do what I want to do. When I want to do it. I don't see any sacrifice. I don't see anything. All I see is me. Flesh is in the way. In other words, flesh is in the way. I can imagine that the rich young ruler was probably devastated at this moment. Why? Because Jesus blew his mind. Jesus said basically that religion wasn't enough. Keeping the commandments ain't enough. In other words, coming to church, showing up on Sunday ain't enough. Singing in the choir ain't enough. Preaching ain't enough. Lifting your hands and worship. Oh, y'all not going to talk to me. Y'all going to make me work up here. Yeah. Just crying unto God ain't enough. Amen. You got to deny yourself. Lay aside that thing that makes you you. And that's where the war lies there. We want to have war. That's where the war is. Deny yourself. And you'll see the biggest fight ever known to me. Yep, yep. Truth of the matter is, the, root, the rich young ruler violated two of the three commandments given to us in Luke chapter 9. Yes. Yes. Jesus telling him to deny himself. Yes. Take up his cross yes. and follow me. Yes. Two of these three things the rich young ruler has, has, has violated. Uh-huh. But somebody says it's all or nothing. Uh-huh. Well, you got to say it like you mean it. That's the thing. It's all uh-huh. or nothing. Uh-huh. Philippians 3 and 7 says that, but what things were gained to me? Those things I counted lost for Christ. Indeed, I counted all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb. You know what Paul, what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying that, uh, I have to be careful how I say that. I have to have some home training because I ain't that word deliverance. And, I, and if, this, if this was a truth night, I'll tell you what I really want to say. But let me show some dignity right here. What Paul is actually saying is that that thing that got you separated from a relationship with God, amen, that thing that feels so good to you, that boyfriend, that girlfriend, I mean, that, that filthy life of, of drugs or alcohol, the thing that feels good, he said all that is boo boo in compared to the excellent and the good things that God want to give them to you. Don't deny it feeling like you're rejecting things that you are or your identity, but give it over to God and watch what I really want to give you. The Bible says, I have not seen, ear has not heard. You can't even think about the goodness that God has. Y'all never talk to me anymore. Consider the good things that you think you have is dumb. Yeah. Dumb ain't nothing but animal poop. Think about it. Think about it. What good thing are you holding on to that's separating you from your relationship with God? God is basically saying, it ain't nothing but animal poop. You think you love it, but it ain't nothing but animal poop. Get rid of I got something better in store for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all not going to talk to me tonight. That's right. Come on, now. Luke chapter 9 in our text. Way more in store. Jesus here has called the disciples. He's told them on the mount. He's witnessed to them. They saw him cleanse a leopard. They watched him heal a man that was paralyzed. 
They watched him heal the man with a withered hand. They watched him heal the centurion servants, uh, a servant. They watched him help a one, uh, heal a woman with the issue of blood. Teach. Raise Jarius' daughter. Yeah, yeah. They watched him raise a man, a man, a woman's son from the dead. They watched him loose demons from a man. They watched him forgive a woman's sin. They watched him calm the storm. And now Jesus drops a bombshell on him. If you want to be my disciple. All right, now let's talk. In other words, the disciples probably was a little content thought they had already arrived. Yeah, since a whole lot of us in here think we gonna rock. We just gotta it out. God gave us a little message, gave us a little word, we think we didn't arrive. God gave us a song, we didn't, we didn't think that we didn't, we didn't got it made. God gave us a talent or a gift, and we think that we didn't made it in the glory. But I got news for you, God will drop a bombshell on you. In order to be my disciple, you ain't got there yet. You gotta learn something. Deny yourself. Several it through the study of the Gospels. The self-denial at this point wasn't a problem for the disciples. But phase two was a bit more challenging. Somebody say all or nothing. Take up your cross and follow me. Understand something, beloved. Taking up your cross. The cross is symbolic to one thing. And that's death. See, what Jesus is saying here, let me, let me bring it down for some of us that may understand. Some of us may not be as fortunate. Amen. And has anybody ever been denied for anything in here? Come on. I know yeah. more people here that's been denied. For, you done applied for some loans and got denied. You worked for some cars and got denied. Some jobs and got denied. Shall I keep going? Everybody here at one time or another has been denied. You asked for a girlfriend and she denied you. And what do we do when we get denied? We move on to the next. Jesus is saying right here is that after you deny yourself, you got to die. I wish I knew I could move. Maybe that'd help. But he says after you deny yourself, because once you get denied, I don't need you going back to something else. You got to die. We hear you. We hear you. Taking up your cross, you got to die. You got to die. Paul says in Galatians chapter, chapter 2 and 20, he says, For I have been crucified with Christ. For it is no longer I who live, but the Christ that lives within me. And the life that I now live is not my own, but rather I live it by faith through the Son of God who loved me and gave himself just for me. See, the issue with selling out in this day and time is that nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to die. We become accommodating and we become useful in ministries and in church. I ain't talking about y'all. I'm talking about us over there on other, on other street. Hey, amen. I'm all right. I'm talking about everybody. And we become accustomed, amen, to being accommodating and not transforming lives in the house of God. Watch this. Watch this. And we've got people in operation and doing things in the house of God upon the name of our no God, but they haven't died. You want to know why our youth is in such a disarray and why our churches is up in hell and, and why people of God are not being transformed? It's because people have not died. You got to die. Somebody out of shock got to die. The prosperity message has destroyed us. The self-willed and empowerment message have destroyed the church in this dispensation. Surely God wants us to have the best. God wants us to obtain the best of things. God wants you to have the finer cause, the best of the houses, the best of the job. But somebody's got to suffer. My God. Somebody's got to suffer. Help us. Come on, guys. The priests in the in the Bible of in the Bible in the, in the Old Testament in the Old Testament the priests in the Old Testament Amen when they would approach the altar to getting ready to render a sacrifice unto the Lord you understand and study the Bible it tells it teaches you that the priests had to have some kind of trade and they had to have a trade in ringing because they understood that as I get ready to approach the altar my sacrifice is going to leave. Well, it's rather going to leave the temple in a different form than it came into the temple. All right. 
Get the message there for a moment. When you come into this temple, you should never leave the same way you came. See, coming to the altar in that day was nothing like coming to the altar in this day. You know, we come up, we do a little cute cry, we repeat what the preacher says, we dry our eyes, amen. But the priest knew that coming to the altar, he was getting ready for work. He was getting ready to struggle a little bit. Yeah. Because oftentimes they would have to drag the calf or the herd or the, or, or the cattle or whatever the sacrifice, they would have to drag it to the altar yeah. because just out of this beast, rather, sometimes and very more times than not, often had an inkling that this wasn't going to be good for me. Yeah. And if I get to the altar, I'm going to have to yeah, die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You ever wonder why it's such a war with your flesh? Because flesh knows that if you get to the altar, yeah. it's going to have to die. Yeah. Y'all not going to talk to me. I'm not going to go ahead and preach. It's going to have to die. You're going to tell somebody it's going to have to die. Yeah. Yeah. The altar was nothing like it is today. Yeah. I, I, I kind of cracked at the musician as he came up to the altar and he put that big old foot up and just walked on up here. But if it was an altar of old, it was seven foot wide, seven foot long, seven foot high. I mean, if you want careful, you hurt yourself with a with a fighting with a fighting sacrifice. Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. Because a two or three ton beast, amen, can ultimately kill and hurt you. Y'all yeah. not gonna talk back to me, amen. So you have to be careful with the sacrifice. But one thing that we understood for the priest's job is that if it didn't die, it wasn't gonna work. You gotta understand something. You gotta die. You got to die. Want to know why the church is in such an uproar? Because nobody's died. We're not grabbing people and putting them on the altar and telling them you got to die. You got to die. Jesus said, Jesus said, deny yourself. Strip yourself from everything that makes you you. And then take up your cross. You got to die. And the blessed hope. Is that he says, come and follow me. Yeah. Understand something, beloved? Yeah. That the good news is that death in Christ yeah. is never the end. Yeah. Yeah. There's a song the old church used to sing that said, I can die now. Oh, not to die I don't have to die no more. Yeah. Following Christ will never lead you to a place of desolation and ruin. Amen. I mean, but we'll be comforted like Abraham. I may not know where I'm going or what I see or what's before me, but I know this one thing. I'm looking for a building. The builder and maker is God. God. Yes, yes. I'm searching for a builder. I don't know much, uh -huh. but I'm looking for a builder yes. whose builder and maker, the foundation has already been laid. Yes. And that's God. Yes. So in the meantime, I'm following Jesus on this tedious journey. Uh -huh. The commitment seems a little too hard to bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When my faith gets weary and shaky. And because after all, I'm following Christ. I can do what David said in a very familiar song. He said, because I'm following him, the Lord is my shepherd. Right. Because I'm following him, the Lord is my shepherd. Because I'm following him, I shall not walk. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Because I'm following him, he leads me beside the still water. Y'all not going to talk back to me. Is anybody in here following God? Is there anybody that's trying to confuse and when things are against you, you try to figure out how you got a peace in the middle of the, of the storm? And then because I'm following Jesus. All right. Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. Amen. I mean, it may be tough and may get hard, but as long as you follow him, and then we can search for that building and it's anticipated. He tells us in, in Romans that for as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That means the Spirit of God has engulfed itself around me. God, where you want me to go? I'll go. Where you want me to do? I'll do it. My hands are not my hands. My eyes are not my eyes. My lips are not my lips. My thoughts are not my thoughts. My behavior and ways are not my ways. But God, it belongs to you because I'm following you. Clap your hands and tell God thank you. Praise God. He said he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Feel the weak, he'll restore your soul when you're following him. Jesus. Jesus. Leads me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. 
That's why he can't let me go because it's his name. Yeah, yeah. It's for his name. Yeah. When you know that you're following him, it's his name. Yeah. That he got to see that he's holding up. Yeah. Even though right. I walk through the valley of the shadows of death. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm following him, I won't feel no evil. Y'all yeah. yeah. not going to talk back to me. Yeah. So you are with me. Yeah. Thy rod and thy staff, it comforts me. Yeah. Yeah. You anointed my head, you that prepared the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Yes, sir. You anointed my head with oil. Yes, my cup runneth over. Yes, Surely goodness and mercy yes, shall follow me all the days of my life. Yeah. Because I'm following him, I'm gonna dwell in the house of the Lord. Y'all not gonna talk back to me. Can you imagine when you get to a place where you dwell in? I'm not talking about having a feeling. I'm not talking about passing by. I'm not talking about getting a touch. I'm talking about dwelling in the presence of God. Okay. In the presence of God where it's the fullness of joy. In the presence of God where there is no pain. In the presence of God where there is no sorrow. Every day is howdy, howdy, and never goodbye. Yeah. I thank God for getting into the presence of God. And the blessed hope of the message is that when you get to a place on earth where you feel a little empty, if you get to a place on earth where you feel like throwing in the towel and giving up, God will allow you to taste heaven on earth. Y'all not going to talk back to me. It, it, it's called the day of Pentecost. When there was a rushing of a mighty wind that came in and fell on everybody that was ready to receive. Do I have a witness in the day? Is there anybody here that don't mind being ready, willing, and able to be used by God? If you are, open up your mouth and tell God thank you. Tell God thank you. To receive what you have for me. Clap your hands and tell God thank you. Come on, clap your hands and tell God thank you. Deny yourself, kill yourself, and follow Christ. Clap your hands and tell God thank you. Put your hands together, boy. Oh, God, what a mighty word. Woo! Mighty! Hey. Touch me down in my soul. Somebody tell God thank you.